What the white whale was to Ahab has been hinted what at times he was to me is yet remains unsaid. Aside from those more obvious considerations, touching Moby Dick, which could not but occasionally awaken in any man's soul some alarm, there was another thought, or rather vague, nameless horror concerning him, which at times by its intensity completely overpowered all the rest, and yet so mystical and well-nigh ineffable was it that I almost despair of putting it in a comprehensible form. It was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. But how can I hope to explain myself here, and yet in some random, distant way, explain myself I must, else all these chapters might be naught. Though in many natural objects, whiteness refiningly enhances beauty as if imparting some special virtue of its own, as in marbles, saponicas, and pearls, and though various nations have in some way recognized a certain royal preeminence in this hue, even the barbaric grand old kings of Pegu, placing the title Lord of the White Elephants above all their other magniloquent descriptions of dominion, and the modern kings of Siam unfurling the same snow-white quadruped in the royal standard, and the Hanoverian flag bearing the one figure of a snow-white charger, and the great Austrian Empire, Caesarian, heir to the overlording Rome, having for their imperial color the same imperial hue. And though this preeminence in it applies to the human race itself, giving the white man ideal mastership over every dusky tribe, and though, besides all this, whiteness has been even made significant of gladness, for among the Romans a white stone marked a joyful day, and though in other mortal sympathies and symbolizings this same hue is made the emblem of many touching noble things, the innocence of brides, the benignity of age, though among the red men of America the giving of the white belt of wampum was the deepest badge of honor, Though in many climes, whiteness typifies the majesty of justice in the ermine of the judge and contributes to the daily state of kings and queens drawn by milk-white steeds. Though even in the higher mysteries of the most august religions, it has been made the symbol of the divine spotlessness and power by the Persian fire worshippers, the white forked flame being held the holiest on the altar and the Greek mythologies, great Jove himself being made incarnate in a snow-white bull. And though to the noble Iroquois the midwinter sacrifice of the white dog was by far the holiest festival of their theology, that spotless faithful creature being held the purest envoy they could send to the great spirit with the annual tidings of their own fidelity, and though directly from the Latin word for white, all Christian priests derive the name of one part of their sacred vestiture, the alb or tunic, worn beneath the cassock, and though among the holy pomps of the Romanish faith, white is specially employed, in the celebration of the Passion of Our Lord, and though in the vision of St. John, white robes are given to the redeemed, and the four and twenty elders stand clothed in white before the great white throne, and the Holy One that sitteth there, white like wool, yet for all these accumulated associations, with whatever is sweet and honorable and sublime, there yet lurks an elusive something in the innermost idea of this hue, which strikes more of panic to the soul than the redness which affrights in blood. This elusive quality it is, which causes the thought of whiteness when divorced from more kindly associations and coupled with any object terrible in itself to heighten that terror to the furthest bounds Witness the white bear of the poles and the white shark of the tropics. What but their smooth, flaky whiteness makes them the transcendent horrors they are, 
that ghastly whiteness that is in part such abhorrent mildness, even more loathsome than terrific to the dumb gloating of their aspect, so that not the fierce fanged tiger in his heraldic coat can so stagger courage as the white shrouded bear or shark. With reference to the polar bear, it may be possibly be urged by him who would fain to go still deeper into this matter, that it is not the whiteness separately regarded, which heightens the intolerable hideousness of that brute. For, analyzed, that heightened hideousness, it might be said, only rises from the circumstance that the irresponsible ferociousness of the creature stands invested in the fleece of celestial innocence and love, and hence, by bringing together two such opposite emotions in our minds, the polar bear frightens us with so unnatural a contrast. And even assuming all this to be true, yet, were it not for the whiteness, we would not have that intensified terror. As for the white shark, the white gliding and ghostliness of repose in that creature which beheld in this ordinary of moods strangely tallies with the same quality in the polar quadruped. This peculiarity is most vividly hit by the French in the name they bestow upon that fish, the Romish mass, for the dead begins with the requiem eternum, eternal rest, whence requiem dominating the mass itself and any other funeral music. Now, in allusion to the white silent stillness of death in this shark, the mild deadliness of its habits the French call the queen. Bethink thee of the albatross, whence come those clouds of spiritual wonderment and pale dread in which that white phantom sails in all imaginations, not Coleridge first through that spell, but God's great unflattering laureate, nature. I remember the first albatross I ever saw. It was during a prolonged gale in waters hard upon the Arctic seas. From my forenoon watch below, I ascended to the overclouded deck, and there, dashed upon the main hatches, I saw a regal feathery thing of unspotted whiteness. And with a hooked Roman bill sublime, at intervals, it arched forth its vast archangel wings as if to embrace some holy ark. Wondrous flutterings and throbbing shook it. Though bodily unharmed, it uttered cries as some king's ghost in supernatural distress. Through its inexpressible strange eyes, methought I peeped to secrets which took hold of God. As Abraham, before the angels, I bowed myself. And the white thing was so white, its wings so wide, and in those forever exiled to waters, I had lost the miserable warpings of memories, of traditions, and of towns. Long I gazed at that prodigy of plumage. I cannot tell. I can only hint that things that darted through me then, but at last I awoke, and turning, asked a sailor, what bird was this? A goonie! He replied, Goonie. Never, never had heard that name before. It is inconceivable that this glorious thing is utterly unknown to men ashore. Never. But some time after, I learned that Goonie was some seaman's name for albatross. So that by no possibility could Coldridge's wild rhyme have had aught to do with those <laughs> mystical impressions which were mine when I saw that bird upon our deck. For neither had I then read the rhyme nor the bird to be an albatross. Yet in saying this, I do but indirectly burnish a little brighter the noble merit of the poem and the poet. I assert then that in the wondrous bodily whiteness of the bird chiefly lurks the secret of the spell, a truth the more evinced in this that by a 
solecism of terms, there are birds called gray albatrosses, and these I have frequently seen, but never with such emotions as when I beheld the Antarctic fowl. But how had the mystic thing been caught? Whisper it not, and I will tell with a treacherous hook and line as the fowl floated on the sea. But at last the captain made a postman of it, tying a lettered leathern tally round its neck with the ship's time and place, and then letting it escape. But I doubt not that leathern tally meant for man was taken off in heaven. And when the white fowl flew to join the wing-folding, the invoking, the adoring cherubim, most famous in our Western annals and Indian traditions is that of the white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk-white charger, large-eyed, small-headed, bluff-chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in his lofty, over-scorning carriage. He was the elected Xerxes of vast herds of wild horses, whose pastures in those days were only fenced by the Rocky Mountains and the Alleghenies. At their flaming head, he westward trooped, like at that chosen star which every evening leads on to the hosts of the light. The flashing cascade of his mane, the curving comet of his tail, invested him with housings more resplendent than gold and silver beaters could have furnished them. A most imperial and archangelical of Parisian, that unfallen western world, which to the eyes of the old trappers and hunters revived the glories of those primeval times when Adam walked the majestic as a god, bluff bowed and fearless as this mighty steed, whether marching astride his aides and marshals in the van of countless cohorts that endlessly streamed it over the plains like in Ohio, or whether his circambient subjects browsing all around in the horizon, the white steed galloping reviewed them with warm nostrils reddening through his cool milkiness in whatever aspect he presented himself. Always to the bravest was his spiritual whiteness chiefly, which so clothed him with divineness, and that this divineness had that in it which, though commanding worship, at the same time enforced a certain nameless terror. But there are other instances where this whiteness loses all that accessory and strange glory which it invests in the white steed and albatross. What is it that in the albino man so peculiarly repels and often shocks the eye as that Sometimes he is loathed by his own kith and kin. Is it that whiteness which invests him, a thing expressed by the name he bears? The albino is, as well, made as other men, has no substantive deformity. And yet this mere aspect of all-pervading whiteness makes him more strangely hideous than the ugliest abortion. Why should this be so? Nor in quite other aspects does nature in her least parable, but not the less malicious agencies, fail to enlist among her forces this crowning attribute of the terrible. From its snowy aspect, the gauntulated ghost of the southern seas has been denominated the white squall, nor, in some historic instances, has the art of human malice emitted so potent an, an exuberance. How wildly it heightens the effect of the passage of Frosar when, masked in the snowy symbol of their faction, the desperate white hoods of Ghent murder their bailiff in the marketplace. Nor, in some things, does the common hereditary experience of all mankind fail to bear witness to the supernaturalism of this hue. It cannot well be doubted that the one visible quality in the aspect of the dead which most appalls the gazer is the marble pallor lingering there. As if indeed that pallor were as much like a badge of consternation in the other world, 
as a mortal trepidation here. And from that pallor of the dead, we borrow the expressive hue of the shroud in which we wrap them. Nor even in our superstitions do we fail to throw the same snowy mantle round our phantoms, all ghosts rising in a milk-white fog. Yea, while these terrors seize us, let us add that even the king of terrors, when personified by the evangelist, rides on his pallid horse. Therefore, in his other moods symbolize whatever grand or gracious thing he will by whiteness. No man can deny that in its profoundest idealized significance it calls up a peculiar apparition to the soul. But though without descent at this point be fixed, how is mortal man to account for it, to analyze it? it would seem impossible. Can't we then by the citation of some of those instances herein this thing of whiteness, though for the time either wholly or in great part stripped of all direct associations calculated to impart it to aught fearful, but nevertheless is found to exert over us the same sorcery, however modified, can we thus hope to light upon some chance clue to conduct us to the hidden cause we seek? Let us try, but in a master like this, in a subtle appeal to the subtlety, and without imagination, no man can follow another to these halls. And though doubtless some at least of the imaginative impressions about to be presented may have been shared by most men, yet few perhaps were entirely conscious of them at the time, and therefore may not be able to recall them now. Why to the man of untutored ideality, who happens to be but loosely acquainted with the peculiar character of the day, does the bare mention of Whitsuntide marshal in the fancy such long, dreary, speechless processions of slow-pacing pilgrims, downcast and hooded with new-fallen snow? Or is it to be unread, unsophisticated Protestant of the middle American states? Why does the passing mention of a white friar or a white nun evoke such an eyeless statue in the soul? Or what is there, apart from the traditions of dudgeoned warriors and kings, which will not wholly account for it, that makes the White Tower of London tell so much more strongly on the imagination of an untraveled American? than those other storage structures, its neighbors, the byword tower, or even the bloody, and those sublimer towers, the white mountains of New Hampshire, whence in peculiar moods comes that gigantic why. Irrespective of all latitudes and longitudes to the name the white sea exert such a spectralness over the fancy, while that of the Yellow Sea lures us with mortal thoughts of long, lacquered, mild afternoon on the waves, followed by the gaudiest and yet sleepiest of sunsets. Or, to choose a wholly unsubstantial instance, purely addressed to the fancy why, in reading the old fairy tales of Central Europe, does the tall, pale man of the heart's forest, whose changeless pallor unrustingly glides through the green of the groves, why is this phantom more terrible than all the whomping imps of Bloxburg? Nor is it altogether the remembrance of her cathedral-topping earthquakes, nor the stampedos of her frantic seas, nor the tearlessness of arid skies that never rain, nor the sight of her wild field of leaning spires wretched copestones and crosses all adrop like canted yards of anchored fleets, and her suburban avenues of house walls lying over upon each other as a tossed pack of cards, is it not these things alone which make tireless Lima the strangest, saddest city thou canst see? For Lima has taken the white veil, there is a higher horror in this whiteness of her woe. Old as Pizarro, this whiteness keeps her ruins forever new, admits not the cheerful greenness of complete decay, spreads over her broken ramparts and the rigid pallor of an 
uh, an, an epoxy that fixes its own distortions. I know that. To the common apprehension, this phenomenon of whiteness is not confessed to be the prime agent in exaggerating the terror of objects otherwise terrible. Nor to the unimaginative mind there is aught of terror in those appearances whose awfulness to another mind almost solely consists in this one phenomenon, especially when exhibited under any form at all approaching to muteness or universality. What I mean by these two statements may perhaps be respectively elucidated by the following examples. First, the mariner. When drawing nigh the coasts of foreign lands, as if by night he hear the roar of breakers, starts to vigilance, and feels just enough of trepidation to sharpen all his faculties, but under precisely similar circumstances, let him be called from his hammock to view his ship sailing through a midnight sea of milky whiteness, as if from encircling headlands shoals of combined white bears were swimming around him, then he feels a silent, superstitious dread. The shrouded phantom of the whitened waters is horrible to him as a real ghost. In vain, the lead assures him he is still off soundlings, heart and helm. They both go down. He never rests till blue water is under him again. And yet where is the mariner who will tell thee, Sir, it was not so much the fear of striking hidden rocks, as the fear of that hideous whiteness that so stirred me. Second, to the native Indian of Peru, the continual sight of the snow howdad Andes conveys naught of dread, except perhaps in the mere fancying of the eternal frosted desolateness reigning in such vast altitudes, and the natural conceit of what a fearlessness it would be to lose oneself in such inhuman solitudes. Much of the same it is with the backwoodsmen of the West, who with comparative indifference views an unbounded prairie sheeted with driven snow, no shadow of tree or twig to break the fixed trance of whiteness. Not so the sailor, beholding the scenery of the Antarctic seas, where at times by some infernal trick of legendam in the hours of frost and air, he, shivering and half shipwrecked, instead of rainbows speaking hope and solace to his misery, views what seems a boundless churchyard grinning upon him with its lean ice monuments and splintered crosses. What thou sayest, methinks that white lead chapter about whiteness is but a white flag hung out from the craven soul. Thou surrenderest to a hypo, Ishmael, tell me. Why this strong young colt fold in some peaceful valley of Vermont, far removed from all the beasts of prey, why is it that upon the sunniest day, if you but shake a fresh buffalo robe behind him, so that he cannot even see it, but only smells its wild animal muskness, why will he start, snort, and with bursting eyes paw the ground in frenzies of affright. There is no resemblance in him of any gorings of wild creatures in his green northern home, so that the strange muskiness he smells cannot recall to him anything associated with the experience of former perils. For what he knows, this New England colt of the black bisons of distant Oregon? No. But here thou beholdest, even in a dumb brute, the instinct of the knowledge of the demonism in the world. Though thousands of miles from Oregon, still, when he smells that savage musk, the rending, goring bison herds are as present as to the deserted wild foal of the prairies, which this instant may be, may, may be trampling into dust. Thus, then, the muffled rollings of a milky sea, the bleak rustlings of the festooned frosts of mountains, the desolate shiftings of the windrowed snows of prairies, all these to Ishmael are as the shaking of that buffalo robe to the frightened colt. Though neither knows where 
lie the nameless things of which the mystic sign gives forth such hints, yet with me, as with the colt, somewhere those things must exist. Though in many of its aspects this visible world seems formed in love and the invisible spheres were formed in fright. But not yet have we solved the incantation of this whiteness and learned why it appeals with such power to the soul and more strange and far more portentous. Why, as we have seen, is it at once the most meaning symbol of spiritual things, nay, the very veil of the Christian deity, and yet should be, as it is, the intensifying agent in things the most appalling to mankind? Is it that by its indefiniteness it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? Or is it that, as in essence, whiteness is not so much a color as a visible wide landscape of snows, a colorless all color of atheism from which we shrink. And when we consider that other theory of the natural philosophers, that all other earthly hues, even stately or lovely emblazoning, the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, yea, and the gilded velvets of butterflies and the butterfly cheeks of young girls, all these are but subtle deceits, not actually inherent in substances, but only laid on from without, so that all deified nature absolutely paints like the harlot, whose allurements cover nothing but the charnel house within. And when we proceed further and consider that the mystical cosmetic which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light, forever remains white or colorlessness in itself, and if operating without medium upon matter would touch all objects, even tulips and roses, with its own blank tinge, pondering all this, the palsy universe lies before us as a leper. And like willful travelers in Lapland who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched invidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. And of all these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt?